Um, so, without further ado, let's look, look to the Lord for His Word. And before that, we will read uh, the scripture from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Prasangi Edo Adhyayamu. We'll read the first 10 verses. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 1 to 10. We will read this portion responsively and look to the Lord for the word that He has for us. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 comes after Proverbs and verse chapter 7 verses 1 to 10. Please read it responsibly. And as I begin, please follow along. Um, a good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to the go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of the fools is in the house of mirth. Verse 5. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Verse 7. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Verse 9, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Verse 10, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Let us pray and look to the Lord, shall we? Pardon. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for enabling us to come together this uh, last moments of year 2021. Lord, here we are rejoicing in your goodness, praising and worshipping you, adoring you for who you are in our lives and also acknowledging all the manifold works in our lives, remembering, Lord, your faithfulness that sustains us. Lord, who are we that you have not only bought us with your precious blood, brought us out of this world, but also have given us thy word to be made as thine own people, a treasured possession. Lord, to be your set-apart people in this world. Lord, uh, with a high calling to serve and worship you and to live for you in this fallen world that we live in. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the wisdom that we find in your word that endures forever. We thank you, Lord, for... Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, who is the very wisdom of our lives, Lord, that he not only becomes our sanctification and our redemption and righteousness, but also our wisdom. Lord, we thank you, we praise you that we can come to you and uh, we can, Lord, open up our hearts to hear from you, Lord, that our lives may be enabled to not only live and uh, walk worthy of the high calling, but finish well. Father, we pray that you would speak to me, through me, to each one of us. Remember us this uh, evening. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, open thy word. Bless us, Lord, that our lives may be channeled and challenged, Father, to live for the highest cause of finishing well. Thanking you and praising you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. It's been a, a, a few years uh, or so that I've not been taking the last sermon uh, of the year. I, I always enjoyed uh, preaching on January 1st. Um, and I think uh, there are a couple of advantages in doing that because people are fresh in the morning and uh, they're more awake. Usually sometimes when I'm bringing the sermon, sometimes I might I might see people uh, trying to s struggle to keep their eyes open, but 
in this late hour, it is even more difficult for them. And I pray that the Lord would give you uh, his word as I bring this. The book of Ecclesiastes is a, is a much relevant book for our day. Uh, primarily because it is, as some people title it, is the most postmodern book uh, in giving to us all that the world runs after, which is outside of God, to find meaning, to find fulfillment, to find happiness, to find um, the so-called um, excitement to keep us motivated and move on. And uh, if there is one thing that is a uh, passion for life, um, it, is to, it is to have the thing that excites us so much and the thing that fulfills us, especially on this side of the world where we have most of our basic necessities fulfilled, um, it, it would be an obvious pursuit of ours to find something so fulfilling, so satisfying, so uh, exciting that we would want to get a hold of it, have it and possess it and enjoy it. That's the kind of world that you and I are in, in this side of uh, the world, especially as opposed to our own people in some of uh, our, uh, our own country and villages where there is a struggling to meet their ends meet um, and there is a, a desperation to kind of have food on the table. That's not, the, that's not our struggle in God's rich provision um, beyond much deserving. God has richly given to us in many aspects of all the basic needs. Now that said, it doesn't mean that uh, we have found fulfillment because we see that every year as we come, you and I would come to see in the book of Ecclesiastes a resounding word that seems echoing and it seems relevant. In uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 we read, there is nothing new under the sun. This is the wisest man in the ancient days called King Solomon who writes this. And he observes it and he tries all things that were there at his disposal and comes to a conclusion and phrases this phrase in this book about 37 times he says. He says, vanity of vanities. This has been the deduction of uh, his, all the experiments that he did with his life. Vanity of vanities. About 37 times he writes that. And uh, when you and I come to read book of Ecclesiastes, you and I might be depressed or you and I might also be dejected that there is nothing except for chasing of the wind as Solomon puts it, as vanity. But... Uh, you and I need to understand this book from the true perspective. This is pre-Christ. This is not even without, uh, without Jesus Christ in picture. You don't find Jesus in particular in anywhere here. It is with all the wisdom that is there in this world and try to find a meaning outside of God and His purposes. That is the deduction that anyone would come to. And I was actually... Um, conversing about uh, the, the book of Ecclesiastes in how Solomon says vanity of vanities and a common statement I hear is oh he tried it all he had it all and uh, he could say whatever he want and we don't have it so it's, it's not fair I mean that's the usual kind of response that I have heard some say like that but the truth is, the deduction that he came to and has been penned and kept in the Holy Scripture for us is not that we are not able to try it, but primarily that we don't have to go in the same route and end up with the same deduction, but rather learn from the painful lessons that Solomon had to bring us to know what is something better, what is good for man. As Solomon attempts to in the second part of this book, in Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, you and I would find 
There are two questions that he is asking. In fact, three, but can be summed up in two. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 gives to us two questions that are asked. And that is where he begins this second part of the book that we are coming to. Um, and even in the portion that we read, chapter 7, verses 1 to 10, I'm only going to focus on verse 8 in particular, but before that I just want to give you the outline as a context of where Solomon brings this, uh, this precious truth about um, what is better. So he begins with this question, verse 11, read with me if you can. It says, seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? This question might seem very cryptic. It is, it is simply to say, what is better for man? That is his, his main question as he begins the second part of the book. Right before that, he says in verse 9 as well, this is also vanity and vexation of the spirit. He has taken a lot of effort in all the first six chapters to pursue after. I listed these uh, the other day where we were touching on the sermon with regards to covetousness. And I said that uh, Solomon had tried it all. He tried with wisdom, he tried with wild living, he tried with wine, he tried with works, he tried with water pools, he tried with wealth, he tried with wives. And with all these things, he comes to say it is vexation of spirit and vanity. And uh, that has been the first uh, section of the book as a summary. But before he concludes the whole of Ecclesiastes, he also has this vital important question. What is good for man? What is better for man? And uh, as he begins with verse 11 in chapter 6, he also goes on to say in verse 12, the second question, For who knoweth what is good for man in this life all the days of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow. He's asking that. And then, for who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? These are the two questions he's asking. What is good for man and who can tell that to him? And uh, if there is one thing that you and I need to know in these two questions, if there is... Nothing else that you and I can take home tonight from the word. I want us to catch this phrase called better. Because Solomon not only labored with everything to come to a deduction, but he did by the grace of God and the spirit of God was used to pen down certain profound things which are better. As he begins in chapter 7 verse 1 onwards, in the 10 verses he gives 10 things that are better. I'm not here to give all the 10 things in, uh, in detail, but just list them for us so that we can focus on the one thing that I want to have us really spend the rest of the time that we have uh, before us. The 10 things, just to give a quick list, chapter 7, verse 1, a good name that is better than precious ointment. The day of death, the second one is the day of death that is better or than the day of one's birth. And then verse 2 gives the third one. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. And then verse 3, he gives sorrow is better than laughter. Verse 5, he says it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. And then in verse uh, 8, he says better is the end of the thing than the beginning thereof. And then in verse 8, second part, he says, and the patient in the spirit is better than the proud in the spirit. And then quickly in verse 9, you don't find exactly something as better, but you would find it in a different way. Be not hasty, or it is better to have a quiet spirit or than the spirit or, or an angry spirit. I, I just rephrased it for us to understand. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. And quickly, the tenth one is in verse 10. It says, Say not thou, what is the cause for the former days were better than these? Former days are, 
actually not better. In another sense, he's saying the later days should be better. These are the 10 things that at least Solomon gives as a list before he goes about to give us much more things of, uh, of what wisdom can bring in verses 11 and 19. So let's, let's come back to not all of the list, but one in particular in verse 8. He says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. How many of us um, wish Happy New Year? I mean, we are going to have, within a few more hours, we are always going to say, um, as, the big, as the year begins, 2022, we are going to gladly wish each other Happy New Year. There is so much of excitement in the beginning of something, right? Rather than in the end of something. Who is not excited? And in fact, there is a common phrase among the Andraites, if you are familiar, there is a Telugu phrase which goes, Andrula Aramba Suratvamanantar. It is like Andraites are super excited in the beginning, it seems, because they don't care how it, things are finished. They just want it to be beginning. Who is not excited with a new beginning of a new company or a new, I mean, wedding for that matter? There is super excitement. Uh, of how things are going to begin. Uh, every first step of a little child, every new beginning of a first word that is spoken, it is recorded, captured, stored, etched on stone, so that nobody would be able to wipe that out. That's how much we are so concerned about the beginnings. And we want such excitement uh, to, per to persevere, but sooner or later, I guess, after a month, not even a month, a week or so, <laughs> we are there. Oh, and there's nothing, oh, everything is just like that. Oh, there's nothing new. I mean, all the New Year resolutions within a week, more exercise, more drink water, all those things will be gone within a few days. Uh, so that excitement is gone soon and uh, there is no follow through, there is no proper finishing. It is only at the beginning. Uh, and uh, sadly, that is how things are in this world. And that ought not to be the case is what Solomon says. He says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. How can it be that ending is better than beginning? In fact, he gives a clue in touching on two aspects of similar things that are about the end rather than the beginning. Um, and both those two things are going to give us two frames or two dimensions for us to examine how can we ensure that the end is much greater and bigger and grander than the beginning. We are coming to year 2021. I'm, I'm sure there was so much of excitement in the year 2021 as things began. We, we were excited that hopefully the pandemic will end or we were excited that so many greater things are going to be accomplished this year, but we are coming to the end. How is our 2021? As we were reflecting, there were great things that God has done. Is it, is it that the end of 2021 is better and greater than the beginning of 2021? Some of us have not our loved ones, and they have been called to glory. They have finished their course. Some of them are no more. And in the midst of all that has happened, can we say for sure that 2021 ending is greater, grander, bigger, and uh, more exciting than the beginning of 2021? If not, then there is something lacking that you and I need to take from the wisdom of Solomon here and the wisdom of Scripture in, in particular to see what we can do for 2022, not that it shouldn't begin well, but in particular that it should end well, that we would be able to finish well. And uh, God's word does have richness of his wisdom available for us, and he longs that we finish well rather than just beginning well. And so that said, the two clues to give us those two dimensions are found in verse 1 and verse 10 as a framework that we would find as a... Uh, um, in verse 1, there are two things that Solomon talks about, about 
better. The first one is a good name is better than the precious ointment. That is, the Solomon speaks about a good testimony. We just had some few testimonies here. Many a times, um, we, this name is not so much about the real physical names that you and I have. It is about a good report that you and I can have. Good report of God in particular, not what man can give about us. Man might say a hundred things about us. But as Bible says in Luke chapter 16, it says, the one who is honorable among men is abomination before the Lord. It might be that we might be regarded great and um, so high by people, but how is it that God, what is it that He can say? Can He give a good report of you? And what is the report that He can give about you? And uh, that is the kind of name that is better than precious ointment. Some of us might have come here with whatever perfumes, whatever we use, but Solomon says, to God, our, our report or our testimony or our name in particular or what we are should be, should be so better, I mean, it is, it is better than a precious ointment. That is, we see that God gives us to have a sweet aroma of Christ. And you and I, if you are not in Christ, you have no aroma of Christ coming out from you. It is your and my aroma, a death, an aroma of death, as 2 Corinthians chapter 2 talks about, that there is an aroma of death that is going to God if you are not in Christ Jesus. And God has not uh, made you or has allowed you to keep continuing to stay in 2021 alive to give Him an aroma of death. That's not God's desire. He longs you and I that there should be a sweet aroma of Christ coming out from our lives. And that is only when you and I are in Christ Jesus. And so this is uh, a little thing that I just touched about good name. But the main thing I wanted to touch about the two dimensions is the ending. In chapter 7 verse 1, Solomon says, The day of death than the day of one's birth. Solomon says something very paradoxical, very um, contradictory in some sense. Uh, he says, the day of death is better than the day of one's birth. We never hear people celebrating happy death day, right? We always see people celebrating happy birthday. Why is it so that Solomon says that the day of death is better than the day of one's birth? This is about the ending, actually. This is one dimension. We'll come back to that, but there is another dimension, which is, in verse 10, we find, Say not thou, this is what he says. But we always say this. So that's why he says, don't say this. What is he saying? Why, sorry, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Meaning, if somebody is to say, Oh, those good old days. Don't say that, is what Solomon says. Meaning, our days should be that the current days are far better than the old days. If our days are not so, that they were good old days in the past, and current days are not as good as the past, then there's something totally wrong. And this is, the second dimension of how our days are going by. If in the first dimension, how our ending would be, the second dimension is how our days are going by. And we want the wisdom of God to be applied to both these so that we can truly long to see our end be better than the beginning. Or that we would have the finish that God would want us to have. That is a finish that God would... Uh, desire for us. And so, let's uh, come back here. We, when we think about how people uh, can come to a state of saying that it is not those good old days, but these days that are better, we find a number of them in the examples that we find in the scripture. For example, when we think about just the simple thing of beginning and ending, we find 
Abraham, when was Abraham, when did Abraham come to the Lord? We find that it was about good old age of 75 years, right? Um, and it's not too early that he came to the Lord. And uh, by this, some of some usually might take an excuse and say, oh, we have a lot more years to wait before we can come to the Lord. But that's not the point. We find that Abraham came to the Lord at 75, but then his growth in the Lord, in how he grew from faith to faith, to be a man, an exemplary, a man of an exemplary faith, to be a father of faith, that he had grown to such a level, is to show to us of how God could have our, our days to be a blessed ones, so much so that our growth to be uh, finishing well as Abraham finished, where in the end we find in Hebrews chapter 11 that he looked forward for the day and for the city whose maker and builder is God. Abraham was a rich man. Abraham was a mighty man. He had an army in his own house. He had a great number of servants. He had everything that he needed. But he was a godly man in particular to ensure that his end was far better than his beginning. And so we find in Abraham's case, we find in the thief on the cross, sometimes um, we look to this person and there are those who always think, I wish I would be that thief on the cross. I, I don't wish that you be that at all. Because he had no opportunity to serve the Lord. He had no opportunity to live and, uh, and to really be able to glorify God in various ways that you and I, after coming to Christ, can. Somebody says that uh, the thief on the cross did it all and at the end he went to heaven. But the fact is that he had so many things that he missed out. And so it's not, uh, the thing is he finished well at least. He finished in, in Christ with the assurance that he will be in paradise as Jesus assured him. Now, the, the third example I wanted to touch is Paul. We all know how Paul, as a religious Pharisee, he came to the Lord, yes, as a, as a young man, but more importantly, how his finish was. When we see that he could come to a point and say, at the end of his life, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. And there is laid up a crown of righteousness. As he says in 2 Timothy 4, 7, the last letter that Paul wrote, we find that he had finished so well. He has finished so well. Not only he finished so well, he had his days set on course to, to finish well. We find, let, uh, let's turn here in Philippians chapter 3. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Paul says this beautiful statement in verse 13 and 14. This is with regards to how his or her days are, uh, how our days are going by as we compare. Paul was not a man who says good old days. In fact, he would say such grand days are the current days. Why was that Paul could say that? In uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 13 he says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but that one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. He was never after the good old days. The good old days is just, in, in, a, in a way to understand, is just a mindset. There is nothing good in the old days. You and I have more advancement, even in the material realm. Better iPhones, I hope it is better. Every year there is a new iPhone, we hope it is better. At least there is a plus one in the addition of the number, right? If not for any new features sometimes. Well, there are better medical facilities than the, than the olden days. There is a, a greater longevity, longevity of life people are having uh, with all the medical facilities, of course. People have not seen pandemic and that's another story. But more importantly, we find that there is no ground reality to good old days. It is only a mindset. It is about those few things that you and I enjoyed in few days past, few years past, few months past. 
the sweet fellowship of our relatives or a time that was memorable that seems to not go away from our mind those are the things that we think about good old days but there is absolutely nothing in that sense of how uh, we can truly ground it to say really there are good old days than the current days now that is in a physical sense but in a spiritual sense how are our lives as compared to the older days have we grown in the lord more have we grown in our faith have we grown in our dependence have we grown drawn closer to him or far from him and those are wonderful things to contemplate especially as we end 2021 in particular as we compare to the life of apostle paul he says forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth onto those things which are before you know paul knew the the secret of why it is not good to live in the olden days you know many a times if we are sticking to those good old days you forget to do what is rightly the responsible thing to be done today you and i relish oh i did so much ministry then oh i i was so passionate then how about now can you excuse yourself not to continue to serve this great god as you are coming closer to meet him as you are coming closer to meet him can you love him less than how you loved him before and so paul gives to us that there is nothing good to dwell on the older accomplishments of ministry or older days of our spiritual life than to see that our current days are much uh, stronger in faith deeper in love and greater in serving our god than the olden days and so we find this phrase not appropriate the good old days phrase and so we come to understand that god would want us that our former days are not to be better than the later days our later days ought to be better and so and we we come to understand these two dimensions the first one is how our ending would be the second one is how our progressing or how our days that are continuing would be and so we come to uh, one last example and then i'll go on to give us how are we to ensure that our ending our finish would be great uh, i'll i'll touch on few things there and then uh, we'll close but uh, the last example i want to touch upon is the life of jim elliot we all know how he was a missionary uh, as he went and gave his life one of the greatest statement that he says is he is no fool who can give what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose this is a, a statement of his life where he gave it all for christ jesus and uh, the way we remember him today is for what he gave for christ and how he finished so well as opposed to what he might have done all through his life even if it might be serving in various ministries but his finish was so grand and so wonderful that even till date he seems to be inspiring us and encouraging us to finish well and so when we think about uh, finishing well these two things are key that is how are you and i going to run the rest of the race that is ahead many a times we find that uh, we always can have excuses i didn't have a head start i i i wasted all my younger years i wasted so many years oh it is too late i can't do much now for the lord those are some excuses that you and i can give you know uh, i was thinking about usain bolt uh, as as great as he is in the 100 meters dash the record holder um in one of the 100 meters dash he had a, a stumble start and you know um as he stumbled in his start it was a surprise that he didn't have the the right start every um four years they prepare for this this olympics and uh, it is at that time they need to deliver and it turns out on that uh, particular olympics he had a stumble start in the 100 meters final and it it was wonderful that though he had a stumble start in the middle of the race he caught up so well that at the end of the race 
he was looking as as how he always is right he looks to behind and sees uh, unlike many other people who are setting their mind and their eyes on the finish line he keeps looking at the people who are running behind him as though they are trying to catch up to him he enjoys that a lot the truth is he didn't excuse himself to not to finish well because he had a stum- humble i mean stumble start but he caught up he caught up and he actually finished well and that's how for a four time olympic he had been the 100 meter um gold medalist and so when we think about that you and i need to come to asking few questions that would help us asking few questions of how you and i would want to finish well uh, we find this question asked by the psalmist in psalm 39 come with me to psalm 39 david we are looking at um, ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 8 but come with me to psalm 39 where david asked this question in verse 4 and verse 5 sorry verse 4 this is the question that he asks and sometimes we don't ask this question as often as we should and uh, and that's why we never even think about how we finish and the question that david asks is this in verse 4 lord make me to know mine end and the measure of my days what it is that i may know how frail i am and then in verse 5 as the lord uh, the spirit of god inspires him he pens these wonderful words he says behold thou has made my days as a as an hand breath and my age is as nothing before thee verily every man at his best stage is altogether vanity and then there are few other things that he learns in verse 11 in particular the last part of that verse he says thou makest his beauty that is the beauty of man to consume away like a moth surely every man is vanity in telugu you find a different translation there it's not about just vanity it is just breath every man is just a breath we are one breath away from eternity and and how frail we are should make us to recognize who holds our breath who gives us that breath who holds our future and we think our health our wealth or anything else would sustain us for years and years to ahead but it is the one who holds our breath and david comes to ask the right question and he says lord make me know mine end this is a prayer that we need to inculcate i want to know how my end is and that i might end well that i might know how frail i am so that i might begin to recognize how big you are and that i might lean on you depend on you to finish well and to run well the rest of the race these are the two things that we need to set on course to finish well and just like paul if you and i would long to come to a point and say i have fought a good fight and i've kept the faith it it doesn't happen by accident it doesn't happen by a random chance it ought to be that we need to be like apostle paul in how we run the race apostle paul recognized that life is a race in many places in the scripture he gives to us of that race picture in first corinthians chapter 9 turn with me first corinthians chapter 9 verse 24 paul pens these words and he says how he disciplines himself to finish well first corinthians chapter 9 verse 24 let me read that and here he says know ye not that they which run a race run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize so run that ye may obtain and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown but we and incorruptible i therefore so run not as uncertainly so fight i not as one that beateth the air verse 27 but i keep my under my body and bring it on to subjection lest that by any means 
when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. These are precious lessons to learn. Not only we should pray, Lord, show me how frail I am and what my end is, but also we should learn, like Apostle Paul, to run that we may win. To run that we may win. And in that course, the Lord gives to us. Apostle Paul here acknowledges the blessed disciplines that he had been blessed with, given. He set himself. And uh, the author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12 also says this. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 and 2. He says about the lot of cloud of witnesses who are there. Before, after that he says in the middle of verse 1 of chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, he says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here are two questions that we considered. How is my end? And also, in Apostle Paul's case, am I running to win the race? Or am I just running uncertainly, as Paul says? I don't want to run uncertainly. I just don't want to run just for the sake of running and living out my life. There's no point in doing that. Run to win. And he, he, he gives to us the prize that he is looking forward to. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul says, that I may win Christ. This is not about just receiving Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior. This is more than just having Him as a Lord and Savior and say, I have a ticket to heaven. But this is to say that I might win Christ. Meaning, Christ is going to be the, the prize in one of the ways that you and I are going to win Christ is that when you and I are going to meet Him, you and I are going to be like Him. I don't know about you, but uh, especially if you have ever got to see in this world, they say there are probably seven people who look like you in this whole world. If you go traverse all over the world, there might be seven people who look closely, almost like you. I don't know how true it is, but as a Christian, when we are going to see the Lord, what a joy it would be if you and I are able to see Christ and, are, and we are made like Christ in the sense of His holiness and His, His likeness of all the depth of His love and uh, the great grander things that we see in our Lord Jesus Christ. We see in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, when we see Him, we will be like Him. And, and the moment these twins, the look-alike twins, when they come together, uh, that they have never met, say suppose. It will be a thrilling moment to see them come together and just hug each other because of the sameness that they have. And so is our portion as those that are set on course to win Christ, the first greatest privilege is to, is to just fall at His feet and worship Him for all that He poured into our lives to make us like Him, right? as fallen beings, as we were sinful, as we were rotten in our sin, in our fallenness, Jesus not only shed His blood, but patiently through His Spirit is working to make us more and more like Him. And after all that endeavor of, of such patience, that He makes us like Him to see Him, and we being like Him, it's just a thrilling moment to see Him and, and fall at His feet and worship Him. There's a great song, it says, I can only imagine what it would be like when I see Him. Our words would be so short to describe all that we would want to mean to Him. So, Paul says, that I might win Christ. It is more than just meeting Him, by the way. It is cherishing Him. It is treasuring Him. It is finding our everything in Him. And that is when we would long to finish well. Paul saw that and he found that everything that he has, he says his background, his education, his riches, his gain, whatever he sees it as gain, he counts it as loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my 
Lord and he's willing to suffer it all. Suffer all that he may win Christ. Such was the discovery of the grandeur of this prize of the race. And so when we see this, there are, as we took note of the two questions, I want to bring to us uh, two things that would, uh, that would help us in uh, setting on course for the follow through for our days that we are living and for finishing well. The first one that we would see with regards to the follow through is uh, we find it in uh, chapter Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verses 9. Turn with me to come back with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Uh, sorry, verse 10. Verse 10, we talked about how our days should be, that our later days are better than the former days, right? And uh, as we think about that, one of the things that would help us with regards to keeping our later days, uh, in regards to ensuring our later days are better than the former days is that we need to understand how our time is in his hands and that we need to invest our time wisely. Invest our time wisely. That we ensure the days are not passing away without cognizant effort of investing onto eternity. Um, we, we find it in a number of places, but uh, turn with me uh, to one, one small place um, in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 11, we find few wisdom words about time. There is time for everything. As Solomon pens those words in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, he talks about almost 28 things. I won't go listing all of them. You could list them for yourself. But of all the 28 things, he says, these are all the things that happen upon this earth. They naturally happen. There are times beyond our control. There are times within our control. But above all, in all this travail, we see in verse 10, I have seen the travail which God had given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. And in verse 11, he says, He had made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he had set the world in their heart. This, this translation is wonderfully done in ESV. He had set eternity in the hearts of men. God had set eternity in the deepest of our being. That's why we naturally plan as though we are going to live here forever. Don't you see ever that when we buy a house, we never think, oh, I'm going to die in this house or, or I'm going to rent this house. We, we don't even think of all the possibilities that might happen. But we always think we're going to live here forever. We live upon this earth as though we're going to live here forever. Because God had set eternity in our hearts and that's the way we think. But the reality is eternity is in the eternal one. And that's why it begins in in uh, in John chapter 17, verse 3, eternal life is defined this way. Eternal life is not something that we find after our grave, after our death. It begins when we know the eternal one. As John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus in the high priestly prayer, he prays, and this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Eternal life begins as we begin to know the eternal one. And the more we invest our time in this eternal one and the things that are lasting, that is how we can ensure that our, our later days are, are far better than the former days. Enough have we spent in all that, that time that goes in, a time to pluck, a time to a plant. I'm not saying you shouldn't do gardening. You can do gardening. <laughs> and... Uh, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather them. There's so many things that we do. At the end of the year, we take stock. What happened? There was a week of vacation last week and I didn't know. Time went by so fast. 
and of course i was good investment in various other things as well for the lord but nonetheless time is flying away unless we invest it's going to be like a vapor vanishing away soon from our hands and that's what solomon says there's time for everything upon this earth but god has set eternity in our hearts and we need to invest what we have received every day and putting it in the eternal one which is going to yield hundredfold because it is in this eternal one that things that we put in or invest in is going to turn it into hundredfold in in uh, Matthew chapter 10 we find uh, the disciples of our lord jesus christ as they come to to see that they have given up everything for the lord in verse 36 in matthew chapter 10 verse 37 jesus talks about this of how our love to our lord should be of the preeminent one beyond the love that we have to our father mother even to our spouses as well in another parallel passage he says that we ought to take up our life in verse 39 we read he that findeth his life shall lose it and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it it is like we take our life and the time that god gives to us the resources and we put it so that we gain it all hundredfold as uh, in another parallel passage we find that we have left everything lord as peter says and uh, we find that jesus says if you have left everything you would gain it in hundredfold that's the portion of those that invest and so this is on one side about the follow through for the days that are there in our life now quickly in closing i want to touch upon the finishing not just the follow through for the days that are there the finishing we find it nowhere else in except for the very words of our lord jesus christ two verses and then i'll just close in john chapter 17 verse 4 jesus sets the model in how you and i are to finish yes we can take inspiration from apostle paul jim elliot and many others that we have looked at but no one else comes close to the highest order of the of the kind of finish our lord jesus christ did as in john chapter 17 verse 4 jesus says I have glorified thee on the earth I have finished the work which thou hast thou gavest me to do this is the kind of report that Jesus when he looks back to his own life he could see it and say that he had finished it well he had glorified the father he was not even on the cross but he knew that his heart is set he prayed and he has said let your will be done and he said here i go and he prays this high priestly prayer not for more for himself but for his disciples and for you and for me as we as we saw in the whole of chapter 17 that only three verses are there for him but the rest of it for his disciples and for us and us as well as we saw in verse 20 that he prays for all those that would believe through the words of the apostles that is you and me and when we see how jesus he finished so well in his own life to say i have glorified thee he also gives to us a parable which helps us to set our lives to finish well in matthew chapter 25 we know the parable towards the end of his ministry in his teaching he gives a parable and he gives one of the grandest accolade that you and i should be looking up to the parable is of how the kingdom of heaven is like a tra- a man traveling into a far country who calls his own servants and delivered them his goods and then he gives these talents 5 2 and 1 and he calls them to account of how they finished how they invested and how they did what they did at the end find this accolade that is repeated in verse 21 and also in verse 23 this is the accolade that every child of god is going to look up to many times our christian lives are lived out just to do another small ministry or another um another year in the lord to grow but our christian lives should be set on set on course to have this accolade in our mind this is 
it says in verse 21, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few. I will make thee a ruler of many. Enter thou into the joy of the, thy Lord. Here, the Lord is looking at faithfulness. In the end, he is going to see how faithful we are. We are to be a good and a faithful servant. And that is the accolade that we come to reckon with. It's not well done, good and successful servant. How, how grand is your ministry? How many people you influenced? It is how faithful you are in all that you have been called to do. Whether you have been faithful to teach the way you are to teach. Whether you have been faithful as a father to your children in parenting them. Many times we have all the shortcuts on the earth. In uh, the rest of the verses, if you see, of all the betters and not the betters that you find in the list of Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verses 1 to 10, you find all the non-betters are shortcuts. Shortcut to bribe, shortcut uh, to have anger, shortcut of many things that the devil comes to give and offer. You and I have choice to choose to go to the shortcut or go in the highway, the king's way or the narrow way. And uh, when, I, when I come to see how the Lord would want us, He wants us to have this accolade in being a faithful in all the roles that you and I are called to. As a husband, you and I are called to be faithful. As a wife, you and I are called to be faithful to the relationships. Oh, there are many who may have, I mean sadly, when we come to this accounting of our relationships, we might see some having relationships that are broken, there is no talking anymore. There are bro relationships that are not only broken, but some are bitter. There is, if there is talking, there is not proper talking, but all noise going around. Um, and finally, there are relationships that are better. Meaning, as days are going by, that we are growing in love, growing in serving one another, growing in humility, esteeming one another better. Not only in relationships, but also in all the other things that God is going to account us. In how you and I are to be faithful in, in, our, um, in our time and in our, in, in, our, in our workplaces as God has given us. There is a, a moral compass when you take shortcuts that you and I are going to give into that we are going to be guilty before the Lord and not be able to stand before Him to have this accolade. God would want us that we be found faithful in the workplaces that He has kept us, in our relationships, in all that He has entrusted. Would the Lord be able to say, well done, my good and faithful servant? This is a question. And uh, in all these things, when you and I are going to bring our lives, the rest of the days that are there, to be followed through with wise investment in the eternal one, eternal things. And then to finish well by setting our Lord's words, that is the accolade of well done, good and faithful servant, you and I are going to be able to stand on the day and be able to say, it, the end is better than the beginning. We began in the Lord as He gave us to be born again, to be made as His child. And when you and I are going to be done in our journey of this life, it would be the highest privilege to stand before our Lord and to be like Him and be able to receive this well done, good and faithful servant. It's not that we have to do big things in life. It is for all the things that God gives us as a privilege and responsibility. Even if it means to sweep in the house of God or to take care of some mean and little things, would you and I be found faithful or would you and I just seek uh, to excuse ourselves. And so, may it be that the Lord would give to us the privilege of not only finishing our lives well, in our end well, but beyond just our end in 2022. Not only that God would give a great beginning, but more importantly, a better ending. So much so that we are more depending on the Lord, more closer to the Lord in our walk, and more faithful in all that God has entrusted to us. And so let's ask the Lord 
for his blessing upon this word and take a moment in the light of God's word as we have taken a stock of a number of things that uh, it is time that we just take a pause in the rush that we are in our lives. It is okay for uh, whatever things might be around and uh, distraction but just focus your time with the Lord and as we look to Him and as we ask those questions that we were reminded, Lord, how would my ending be? What would be my end as the psalmist has asked? And uh, how can I ensure that the follow through of my days are going to cause that the later days are better than the former? As we ask those questions, as we reflect, as we reflect in how the Lord has allowed us to end in 2021. And as we take a cue that the Lord longs for us to finish well, not only of our lives, but also in the year that He is adding to our lives, 2022, that the Lord may enable us to not only begin well, but to end better, end well for His glory and uh, for our blessing. As I take a moment myself, I urge you to be Lord. And uh, in silence, let us look to the Lord, not with regards to anybody else sitting next to us. Us and the Lord. It is the Lord who knows our, our thoughts, our deeds, our words, our actions. And it is He who would measure and as he measured the servants to say well done it is he who would take stock and to whom we are to account and may it be that we take a good look at our hearts and and rededicate ourselves commit ourselves if it is for ourselves our strength we would fail again but if it is his strength and his grace and his dependence upon him, there is an end that is far better than the beginning, all because of his patient work that he does in our lives. Take a moment in silence, let us uh, look to the Lord silently reflecting. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for enabling us to be found in your presence, to, Lord, consider your word. We thank you, Lord, for how your words are rich in wisdom, longing not only to give us a new life, a new creation that you have made us in Christ Jesus, but also longing to have us finish well, to have us be found in that place where you would be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, here we are as your people, knowing well of all that limitations, all that failures of ours, all the areas that in our strength that we have failed, that are not hidden to Thee, our thoughts, our words, our deeds. Here we are, Lord, 
longing once again to have you cleanse us in thy precious blood and Lord uh, touch us to renew us to change us and mold us and that we may afresh Lord be committed to lean on you and your strength and to receive that wisdom that comes from above to walk circumspectly Lord to redeeming the time and also Lord the, that we invest all that you give to us in things that are eternal things that are lasting Father here we are Lord uh, longing to be faithful all because of, if, of your faithfulness over our lives Lord we ask that you would once again forgive our unfaithfulness and once again Lord cleanse us in thy precious blood Father, we pray that you would uh, not only give us thy grace to continue to look to thee, but be found faithful in little things and big things, all because you know it all. Father, we pray that you would be with us throughout the coming days and the year that you are adding to our lives. We thank you, we praise you for undeserving as we are when many all around us are falling and are being called home and are and our Lord no more. Father, we pray that uh, as you have given us this extension, help us, Lord, to be faithful and fruitful for your glory. Help us, Lord, to serve you well. Help us, Lord, uh, that we be able to not just start and continue, but finish well, Lord, and that our former days, Lord, and that our later days are better than the former ones. Father, we pray for your grace over our lives and each and every one here. As a church, help us, Lord, to serve you well, faithfully, and to live for you. Father, we pray for our families, for our children, for our jobs, for everything concerneth us, for the life and ministry here. Lord, may your hand rest over us. May you lead us to walk in your ways. We thank you, we praise you. For narrow is the way, Lord, uh, and help us, Lord, to walk in that way. We ask for your blessing upon this year 2020 that you have led us into. Father, we commit ourselves in this year and the time given to us into your hands. You who hold our future would also hold us to help us walk in it and to glorify thee. Thanking you and praising you in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.